Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining today. My name is Ziad Hijazi. I'm a financial advisor here at Gerber Kawasaki. I'm joined today by Aaron Grusho, resident real estate agent at Compass Real Estate in Beverly Hills, as well as Michael Nasir today. He's a mortgage analyst at Insignia Mortgage, also in Beverly Hills. We're really excited for you all to be here. As you all know, this webinar is intended for the first time home buyer. Our goal today is to walk through the process of buying that home from A to Z. Uh, we, you know, one of the biggest goals that an individual or person can have in their financial lives is buying that home. And especially given the current landscape of COVID-19, you know, it seems like people are really valuing having a comfortable place to live, a comfortable place to stay. So we want to outline to those who haven't purchased their home yet what to expect, give you some details on what you need to account for, and just really provide that roadmap moving forward on buying that home. Uh, I'd love to start with Aaron and Mike. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Sure thing. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron. I'm a residential real estate agent with Compass in Beverly Hills. I tend to work with a lot of first time home buyers to some higher end luxury sales all throughout the greater area of Los Angeles. Um, I'm super stoked to be here. Hopefully can provide you guys with some value and I uh, really appreciate you all for tuning in. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I am Michael Nasirzadeh. I am a licensed real estate salesperson and mortgage loan originator. I currently work as an analyst at Insignia Mortgage. We are a boutique mortgage firm located in Beverly Hills, and we assist buyers and people trying to refinance. And we are focused in all borrower types, whether they are a first time home buyer or a seasoned real estate investor. And today I'm going to be sharing with you guys how the mortgage process works and how you can get pre approved for your first mortgage. Thanks guys. Just to give a little more background on myself, like I said before, I am a financial advisor here at Gerber Kawasaki. We're based in Santa Monica. We, um, what we do as advisors, you know, what I do as an advisor is I sit down with individuals and families, talk through and create comprehensive financial plans. We talk through an individual's overall situation. We talk through goals that they're looking to accomplish with their money, create that plan and help them execute on that. And with that being said, a lot of the clients that I work with are younger professionals, and one of their biggest goals is purchasing their first home. And so, um, like I mentioned before, we want to help provide a guideline on what to expect throughout this whole process. And so, without further ado, we're going to get into it. If you guys do have any questions, feel free to submit them in the comments, whether you're tuning in on YouTube or tuning in through Facebook, and we'll either answer them throughout the presentation or at the end. But, um, when it, and so getting into it, when it comes to getting started with buying a home, it's not just about looking for a home and purchasing it, putting down that down payment. It starts years before you start seriously thinking about purchasing that home in terms of planning ahead and, and, and getting ready for that down payment or for, for that home purchase. And so that's where I come in as an advisor. I sit down with clients and we talk about, OK, we're looking to buy a home. Well, what does that take? First and foremost, we need to account for the down payment. That's what we're saving and investing for. So with a down payment, we typically recommend that you can put down at least 20% of the value of the home. Um, we don't want you to put it down, put it down any less for three reasons. First one being, we want you to own a solid percentage of the home, a solid amount of that home. If you buy a home with a 5%, 3%, or even 0% down payment, you can be caught in a situation where if the, if the home price goes down, the value of your home can actually be significantly less than what you owe in your mortgage loan. And so 20% is always a solid number. Beyond that, the lower the down payment that you have, the higher the mortgage payments you have to account for, the higher the monthly costs. And then lastly, if you do put down any less than 20% of your home, you have to also get what's called PMI, which is private mortgage insurance. That is insurance on your mortgage loan. It's an additional monthly payment on top of the mortgage payments that you have to make and the monthly expenses that you have. So 20% is that solid number. That's where we start. And then we talk about, well, what kind of home can I afford? Now, when you think about buying a home, you don't want your monthly costs to be any more than 30% of what you bring in annually in income. And so what we like to do is we like to work backwards. What we do is we take your income, we take 30% of that, and we plug it in to, to find out, well, what kind of mortgage can you afford? Um, once we find that number, we layer on the down payment on top of that. 
Um, and that's how we figure out the value of the home. We're basically running some financial planning calculations backwards to figure out, okay, this is the home I can afford. Now we plan for this down payment. Now, after that, it's a conversation about, continue, a continuous conversation about the monthly costs that come with buying a home. So a lot of people, when they think about purchasing a home, they mostly think about the mortgage as their only monthly costs. But the big things that you also have to account for are property taxes on top of that, along with homeowners insurance or homeowners association, as well as any utility bills, like your energy bill, your gas bill, those kind of things, as well as any maintenance costs. And so continuously having that conversation, making sure that you actually can afford the home that you're purchasing, um, not just the down payment, is very important. A lot of times we have clients who have saved and invested and have enough to make a down payment on a higher value home. But when we talk through the monthly costs, we realize it's not necessarily sustainable. And so having that continuous conversation with your advisor is very important. And now, how are we getting to that down payment? That's the primary focus when it comes to the planning process. And in order to get there, we're not just saving for that down payment, we are also investing. Um, you know, when you save in the bank, unfortunately, interest rates in the bank are just extremely low now and have been for the past decade or two. Uh, you know, I've seen as low interest rates as 0.1%, 0.01%. You know, you're getting pennies on the dollar. And so what you need to do is you need to get your money working for you. And you do that through investing. Um, when it comes to investing, the average rate of return of the American stock market has been about 11% for the past 70 years. We're not going to necessarily invest in 100% stocks for our clients. We are going to invest in a bit of a more balanced portfolio, provide some more conservative options in there. But anything higher than that half a percent, even 1% is going to be putting you in a much better position moving forward um, and get you that goal of buying a home sooner. So we want to get that money invested. So a lot of people then ask me, well, what is the kind of allocation that we should be investing in? And that is the importance of sitting down with an advisor. Um, we're here to talk through your specific situation and exactly what makes sense for you, what are you comfortable with, asking questions along the lines of, well, what is your time frame for buying that home? How much can you save? How comfortable are you with taking risk? And from there, we build an allocation for you that's customized for your specific financial plan. Um, and it's very important when it comes to the process of buying that home. And so, so we have talked through what kind of down payment are we saving for? What is the actual value of the home that we can afford? Having that continuous conversation of affording monthly costs them talking through saving and investing and what kind of allocation you have. That's a lot of where I'm here. That's a lot of my role. And now you're ready to buy that home. Now, <laughs> once you are ready, I'm going to introduce you to Michael or a mortgage broker, which would be Michael in this case. And they're going to take you through the process of getting pre-approved for that mortgage and the rest of that mortgage process. Thank you, Ziad. So for example, you've been working with Ziad for the past couple of years. You've been growing your savings, you've been opening an investment portfolio, and all in all, you've just been getting a better understanding of your financials. And you're at a point in your life where you now feel comfortable buying your first home. And I know it's fun to search Zillow and go look at open houses, but I would highly recommend that before you actually start looking for houses, you ensure that you are qualified to get a mortgage to buy that house. And so today I'm gonna to be walking through the process of getting pre-approved for that mortgage, and I'll be breaking it into four steps. And a few of them do repeat what Ziad was talking about. And the four steps are confirming what down payment you are comfortable making, the documents you will need to apply for a mortgage, confirming the purchase price that you qualify for and that you would like to offer, and third, obtaining that pre-approval letter from a lender or a broker. So I know Ziad spoke about the down payment, so I won't go too much into it. But one really important point I want to make about the down payment is that some people may be under the assumption that once you make that down payment, you are sort of done with expenses. However, that is kind of just the beginning. Now that you own a house, you have a monthly mortgage payment, you have a monthly insurance payment, property taxes, as well as furniture and other stuff like that. So you don't want to spend too much of your savings on that down payment to a point where you don't have enough left over in reserves to cover all these expenses. Again, I know it works on both sides where you don't want to put too small of a down payment, but again, you need to find that sweet spot in the middle where you could put a 
fairly large down payment while still having enough in reserves to cover the expenses that come with owning a house. Another point I wanna make, and this of course doesn't apply to everyone. However, if you are fortunate enough to have say parents or a relative that can assist you, you could always get a gift fund to assist you with that down payment. And the way that works is say your parents offer to help you out with a hundred thousand dollars gift that goes directly to your down payment and that allows you to still make a fairly large down payment without stretching your savings too thin and taking out too much of your own money to put down that payment so again you will work with ziad you will figure out where that sweet spot is and where that down payment is that you can make and from there you can move into the mortgage process this takes us to our next step, and that's the documents needed for the mortgage process. And as a mortgage broker, I have realized that the borrowers that are more organized and have their documents easily accessible will have a much smoother and much more efficient mortgage process because there are a lot of documents that are needed. But again, if you put in a little bit of the heavy lifting at the front and you get all of those documents in order beforehand, you will have a much smoother process. So the few documents you're going to need are as follows. First, you will need your tax returns. And those are your personal tax returns for the last two years. And if this applies to you, you may have some business ownership or you're self-employed. So if you also have business tax returns, they will use those as well. Next, the lender would like to know where you are in assets. And by assets, I basically mean all of your bank statements, whether they are savings accounts, checking accounts, and a retirement account like a 401k, or the investment portfolio you opened with Ziad earlier. So these all contribute to your assets. Next is income. And income is very important because the way mortgages are underwritten is they take what your monthly income is and they figure out what your monthly liabilities are. And you have to be under a certain percentage, usually between 30 to 40%. And that is how they know if you will be able to afford the mortgage you are applying for. So for your income documents, most of you would need your pay stubs. They will ask for the whole month, most recent month of pay stubs, as well as the W-2s you receive at the end of the year. And they'll need the last two years of those. Lastly, just a few miscellaneous documents that may came, come up. One is a copy of your photo ID, which I'm sure everybody has. Next is if you are currently renting, they're gonna to wanna to see that you've been making those rent payments because if say you were late on a rent payment, they will be a little bit more hesitant on giving you a mortgage. So they wanna see that you've made the last 12 months of rent payments in a timely manner. So those are the documents you need to start the mortgage process. And before I go to the next step, I just wanna take a little side note to speak about credit. For those of you who may not be fully aware of what credit is, your credit score is basically a numeric value that shows somebody how good you are at paying somebody back. So for example, anytime you open a credit card, you are borrowing money. And if you make your monthly payments in a timely manner, you will have better credit than somebody who is late on their payments or missed a payment. So before going to a broker or trying to get pre-approved for a mortgage, I would highly recommend accessing maybe Experian or one of these online companies that allow you to see what your own credit scores are and see if they are in the right threshold to be able to qualify for a mortgage. Again, it depends where you are applying for, but I would say above 700 is good. And if you aren't exactly where you wanna be, it is not a big issue. There are multiple resources out there that allow you to improve your credit and you could just take a few months to work on your credit. Meanwhile, you're saving more money and soon you'll be in a good position to get that mortgage. So just to repeat what we've talked about, you have your down payment all set. You know how much you could put down. You have all your documents organized on your computer. You have good credit. And now you could begin the mortgage process. And to do this, you're going to want to know what purchase price you are applying for. And you could do this in a few ways. One is working with Ziad, one is working with a broker, or if you're the type to kind of want to do things on your own, there are many online sources. And one that I would like to use is the Zillow affordability calculator. You can always go in there and like Ziad said, it works backwards. You put in what your down payment is, you put in how much you make every month, you put in how much you have to spend every month on your car payments, on your student loans and so forth. And that way the calculator basically 
works backwards and figures out what purchase price you would qualify for and get a mortgage for. So again, you now have your down payment, your documents and your purchase price. That is when you are ready to reach out to a broker. And of course, I would recommend myself. I would love to get on a call. I would ask a few questions about you, where you make your money and so forth. I would request all those documents we spoke about earlier, and then I will perform my in-house analysis. And basically the analysis is similar to what I spoke about earlier, how I realize and I calculate how much you make every month and how much you spend every month. And I add in that proposed monthly payment that you will be making on this new house, as well as the insurance and as well as the property taxes. And if all goes well and you are at around a 30 to 40% debt to income ratio is what they call it, then you would be qualified for that purchase. So hopefully that is the case for most of you. And once you are deemed qualified, I will provide you with a physical pre-approval letter. And I like to compare this pre-approval letter sort of to the golden ticket of making an offer. And the reason I say that is because a seller will be very hesitant to accept your offer on a house if you do not have the financing support to support you and you have that mortgage locked down. So that pre-approval letter basically tells the seller that, hey, if you accept this buyer's offer, he will easily get a mortgage and you will not have to worry about him providing the funds to purchase the home. So you've gone through all the steps I talked about. You've obtained your pre-approval letter and you're ready to start searching for a home. And that's when I introduce you to my friend, Aaron Grusho at Compass Beverly Hills. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> I appreciate it. So you've been working with Zia to invest and save up for a down payment. You've gone to Mike to assess your finances and you've gotten pre-approved. And now you've finally made it to the fun part of searching for and then purchasing, purchasing your first home. <clears throat> Super exciting. So the first step is to find a realtor. Why work with a realtor? Well, there are a lot of moving parts within the home buying process, and it can be pretty overwhelming, especially as an inexperienced first time home buyer. Now your realtor's job is to be your guide through that entire process, taking you step by step as your personal advisor and looking out for your best interest. There are a lot of legal contracts. There's lots of paperwork to sign. There's tough negotiating and you want a realtor who is going to have your back and make sure that process goes down as smooth as possible. Now, there are plenty of other benefits to working with a realtor, but I think it's worth noting that working with a buyer's agent is actually completely free for you. We get compensated by the seller when the deal closes, and that's a huge win. There is literally no reason not to work with a real estate agent. So where do you find a good real estate agent? What should you look for in a good real estate agent? Well, it's likely you already know one, your friends know one, your family knows one. If not, hi, I'm Aaron. <laughs> Pleasure, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> it's always great to have someone you trust refer you to a credible agent. However, just because you have a friend who has a friend who knows a friend who's an agent, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should work with them. You wanna work with an agent who you get along with on both a professional and on a personal level. You're gonna be spending a lot of time with this agent. You wanna be able to connect with them and relate with them. And also it's important to note that experience isn't everything. Um, there are plenty of experienced agents who unfortunately will not give you their full attention and may pass you on to a lower person on their team. And that's something you want to look out for. You want to work with someone who's going to give you their entire, the full attention. Um, and I'm also going to suggest you do your research. Our information is pretty public. Check out our websites, check out our social media, um, read reviews and testimonials, and then even interview agents. Call them up, let them know, hey, I'm looking to purchase a home. I'm also looking for a realtor. Why should I work with you? Go with your gut, use your instincts. Uh, you're gonna know when someone has your best interests at heart and has good core values, and that's the person you wanna work with. So you found a great realtor. You can finally begin your home search. Super exciting. Now you're gonna to wanna to start thinking about a few things. For example, where do you wanna live? What neighborhoods and areas? And what are you looking for inside of a home? These are gonna be influenced by a few things. For example, your work. You're probably gonna to wanna to live within a reasonable commute distance of your work. You also wanna be thinking ahead. Am I potentially gonna have kids in the near future? Do I wanna be in a good school system? Yes, you know, do I wanna have an extra room for my kid if and when that happens? Yes, do you want more space? Do you want you know, a larger backyard? Do you want a pool? These are all things you wanna be thinking about. But of course, this is also gonna be limited by what you can afford. However, 
you take you took precautionary steps you you prepared and you went to mike and you got a pre-approval and this is going to tell you exactly how much you can afford and this is going to help everyone involved with your home search and purchase so your realtor is going to start sending you listings both on and off market, which is another benefit to working with a realtor because we get to see what's going on behind the scenes, the homes that have not hit the market yet, and we're able to send them to you. And you also should be taking advantage of platforms like Zillow and Trulia, where you can do your own consumer searches, find those listings, send them to us so we can get a better picture of what you're looking for. And uh, it's great. And then your realtor is gonna set up showings for you, for you to see the homes actually in person. You may also be sent to some open houses, um, today, during coronavirus, there are a lot of virtual open houses and virtual showings, so definitely take advantage of those. They're going to help the process a little more. Um, and yeah, it is a process. It's fun, but it's going to take some time, and you want to take your time. You don't want to rush into buying a home you kind of like. You know, you want to find that home that's perfect for you. So let's say you found that perfect home. You're so excited. Now what? Well, your realtor is going to help you write the most clean and attractive offer possible. In today's market, there's a high demand for homes and there's a pretty limited supply, especially in that entry level market, which means that it's likely if you want to buy a home, there are other people who want to buy that exact same one and you're going to be competing against them and you've got to find ways to stand out and get ahead of them. A good realtor is going to know exactly how to do that, how to get ahead of your competition. Sometimes it's offering a little more money, sometimes it's shorter timelines, or it could be as simple as writing a personalized letter to the seller. There are many ways to make your offer more clean and attractive. Your realtor is gonna help you do that. Now, there are always going to be circumstances that are out of your control. You're not gonna get the property. And for that, I always say everything happens for a reason. You know, you're working with a great team who's gonna support you. You will find that property. So best case scenario, you submit an offer, it gets accepted. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> now what? Truthfully, you're still at the beginning. There's a lot more to do. Let's talk about that timeline from when your offer got accepted to when you actually close and get the keys to your new home. And that timeline is called an escrow period. It's typically 30 to 45 days. Um, and during this period, you as the buyer have a lot to get done. Let's talk about some of those things. So your first line of action will be to pay a deposit to the seller. And this is known as your earnest money deposit or your good faith deposit. And this deposit is typically 3% of the purchase price and it's held by an escrow company. Um, an escrow company is a neutral third party that holds monies and holds uh, documents between the buyer and seller. Now I want you to keep this good faith deposit in mind. We're gonna get back to it in just a second. So what's next? is your contingencies. You've probably heard the word contingency in this context before. I like to think of them as checklists. You need to check one off in order to move on to the next and you're on a pretty strict time schedule. So let's talk briefly about the three most typical contingencies you're gonna see. You're gonna start with your loan contingency. Yes, you got pre-approved, but that doesn't mean you have your loan. This is your time to go back to your lender and secure that financing. And what's gonna go hand in hand with that is your second contingency, which is your appraisal contingency. Your lender is gonna uh, order an appraiser to come to the home and assess the home and determine the fair market value of that property. And that's gonna help the lender assess how much they can actually provide to you for a loan. Next is your inspection contingency. Now this is not always required. However, I highly, highly recommend you at least get a general inspection. This inspection is gonna uncover any material defects with the home, any issues you know, in the basement, on the roof, oftentimes things that are uh, undetectable by the naked human eye, they're gonna go and dig into the depths um, and they're gonna see anything that's wrong with the home. If there are any issues, you may be able to go back to the seller and actually renegotiate for a better price or they may be willing to just fix them up for you to get the sale you know, done and complete. Now, remember that good faith deposit. Well, it's gonna come into play right here. If for whatever reason you find, okay, there are too many issues with the home, I don't wanna deal with this, or unfortunately, for whatever reason, you are unable to secure your financing and you don't check off that contingency, you are able to back out of the sale and get your earnest money deposit back, no questions asked. However, if you check off a contingency, you are unable to back out without losing that deposit to the seller. 
in order to mitigate damages to that seller um, in which they have incurred from taking their home off the market and working with you. Maybe you weren't entirely honest, so you checked off that contingency. Well, unfortunately, um, you deserve to lose that. But hopefully that won't happen, especially under my watch. And we're gonna be one step closer to actually closing on the property. You are so close, you're almost there once you've checked off those contingencies. Next, you're gonna have a final walkthrough of the home to observe any repairs the seller may have made and to make sure the home is in the same condition that you last saw it in. And then you will finally close. You will have a date with your closing agent, which is oftentimes the uh, escrow agent that you're working with, where you and the seller will sign documents transferring ownership of the property. And then you're also gonna be paying your closing costs. These may include your title insurance, county and city transfer fees, property taxes, insurance premiums. Your team is gonna work with you ahead of time to make sure there are no surprises and to let you know exactly what you're paying for and how much that's gonna be. Oftentimes the seller's gonna pay for some, sometimes you're gonna pay for some, other times you're gonna split it. It's all very circumstantial, very case by case. But after that, you're gonna get your keys and take possession of the home. And that's it guys, like huge congrats. Um, as you see, there's a lot that goes into this process, but with an excellent team and, and good preparation, you'll get through it with, with minimal hassle and stress. Yeah, I, I cannot stress that enough. You know, the home buying process and buying a home in general is not an easy task and not a small goal to achieve either. And so no. you wanna make sure that process goes as smoothly as possible and having the right professionals by your side to make sure that you are doing so is so important. It's critical, especially with that first time there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns that come into the landscape. And so you want to have professionals there to help you out. Um, that's that's pretty, that's pretty the process, like we said, you know, uh, from planning for that down payment, talking through monthly costs to getting pre-approved for a mortgage and eventually qualifying, taking out that loan to then buying the home, shopping around and actually getting the keys to buy that, to uh, have that home as your own. Um, what we wanted to do now is just kind of take all this information. We know it's a lot. And we want to apply it to an example, give you guys a bit of a case study um, to show what it would look like in the real in the real world. And so in terms of that example, you know, let's say we're working with a couple in their early 30s. It's Romeo and Juliet. They're married. They're living in Los Angeles in their 30s. Uh, Romeo is a teacher and Juliet is a lawyer. Um, they make uh, $250,000 together uh, and actually have been working with me as, a, as an advisor for quite a while. We had sat down in their mid to late 20s. Um, we had talked through their overall finance situation, talked through their goals, built a plan to get to his, uh, their goals. And one of their biggest priorities was buying a home. So we allocated a lot of savings towards that. They actually contributed $2,000 a month for a little over seven years. And we had it invested and growing in a balanced portfolio, about eight, that average about 8% a year. Um, and now they're in the early 30s, they're getting close to buying that home, they're really starting to take it seriously. And so we sat down again, talked through, well, what kind of home can you guys afford? So Romeo and Juliet, uh, they make $250,000 a year. We took 30% of that, which is about $75,000, and backtracked that using our financial calculations, coming to the conclusion that we can afford a $1.3 million mortgage. Now, this is the upper threshold of the kind of mortgage that you can afford. Like Mike had said, and like I had said as well, you have to account for these other monthly costs, such as your homeowner association, your taxes, your utilities. And so we want to provide a little bit of a cushion, shoot a little bit lower. But with that being said, we have this mortgage. Now we layer on the down payment on top of that and come to the conclusion that we're looking for a home for around a 1.4, $1.6 million range. Again, that 1.6 being the maximum. Now, um, after seven years of saving and investing for a home, they had reached a total of two hundred forty thousand dollars invested, which is amazing. Uh, now, with the one point, with the one point four to one point six million home, they're looking for a down payment closer to two hundred eighty, three hundred twenty thousand dollars. But thankfully, their parents were around and, were and had already communicated they're willing to help out, are providing an additional eighty thousand dollars to help support that down payment, which means they have about three hundred twenty k. Uh, the big thing to note here is that if they had taken that 2000 a month and simply saved it in the bank, they would have gotten to that $320,000 or $240,000 number two years later. 
than if they had invested it in that eight, that portfolio growing at eight percent. That is critical. That is it. It's so huge to get into that goal of buying home a bit quicker. Very glad they sat down with me and got their money invested early on and growing. And so now they're ready for that down payment. We've talked through that they can afford the monthly cost. And I introduced them to Mike and Mike took them through the mortgage process from there. Thank you, Ziad. So yes, Romeo and Juliet, give me a call. Like Ziad said, one is a teacher and one is a lawyer. So they are both paid via pay stubs. I get, I have a quick call with them. I understand they're trying to buy a house for around 1.5 million. They are comfortable with putting down the 320,000 down payment with the assistance from their parents. And so the next thing what we need to check is that debt to income ratio I was talking about earlier. And just to keep it simple, I'm gonna use some whole numbers just so you could kind of visualize what I mean by this ratio. So let's say the husband and wife combined make $10,000 a month. And before even thinking about their housing expenses, they have some of their liabilities. They have their credit cards. The wife was a lawyer, so she has some student loans that she's still paying off. They have a car each, so they have car payments. So let's say all those liabilities together is about $1,500. So that is 15% of their income. Now we include that housing expense, the mortgage, the insurance, and the tax. Those are the three things that are included in your housing expense. And say those combined are another $2,000. I know this isn't realistic, but I'm just trying to make it visualable for you guys. So now they're at about $3,500 in expenses and $10,000 in income. So that is a 35% debt to income ratio. And that is a perfect ratio to be at to qualify for a mortgage. So like I said, I collected all those documents that I spoke about earlier. I know how much they have in assets. I've ran their credit. I see how they have good credit. They aren't late on their payments, which is definitely a good sign for a lender. And their debt to income ratio looks great. They're at a 35%. So with that all said, I let them know that they are pre-approved for a mortgage. And as soon as they find a house they would like to put an offer on, they could reach back out and I will provide them a customized letter with their names on it, with the property address on it, the purchase price and the loan amount. And with that piece of paper, they, with their realtor, Aaron, could go and make a very acceptable offer to a buyer, I mean, to a seller. Awesome, thanks for that referral, Mike. <laughs> so we spent some good time looking, looked at a few places, but we ended up finding a perfect three bedroom condo for them in Westwood. Very close commute to both of their works. Um, and my clients were also planning to have a child in the next year or so. So we made sure they were in a great area with a great school system and they had some extra room in the home for uh, you know, the child and an additional room for an at-home office. However, we went into a multiple offer situation because it was a very desirable home. There were a lot of buyers interested in it, um, but we, we were able to outbid them because we were capable of providing their asking price because they went and got pre-approved, knew exactly how much they can afford. Um, in addition, I had my clients write a personal letter to the seller. Turns out the husband uh, actually ended up going to college uh, the same year as the seller. They didn't actually know each other, but they were able to build that connection and it was awesome. We easily secured a loan. We found a few minor issues with the home during inspections, but the seller was kind enough to fix everything to keep the deal moving. We closed and everyone was happy. It was as simple as that. Yeah, and that's the home. That's that's what it would look like as an example. Thank you guys for running through that. Um, obviously, you know there are there. You don't expect the process to go perfect um, every time. There usually are some unexpected things that might come up and might happen. But again, that's what we have us here for as professionals to help deal with that, to help smoothen out those bumps and make things as easy for you as possible. Um, what we want to do now is just talk through some of the questions that have been being asked throughout the webinar. Uh, first and foremost, we had a question from Instagram talking about buying a home to live in versus buying a home as an investment. We can talk about that a little bit. Um, honestly, buying a home to live in, um, there is a lot more benefits when it comes to buy buying a primary residence or that home that you're going to be living in. There's a lot more tax benefits. There's a lot more loans that you can um, that you can qualify for. There are um, different, you know different uh, contingencies you can take from other accounts, retirement accounts, things along the lines of that. Bottom line is 
when you want to buy a home to live in versus investing, you need to think about that. You need to sit down with someone to make sure that it does make sense for your financial situation. Um, it's definitely something worth, worth talking to a professional about. Um, we also did get a couple of questions about the gift tax or tax issues coming from a payment gift, whether it be from parents or friends or family. Um, to talk about that a little bit myself, you know, one thing that you do want to account for with those gift taxes is or with that gift payment is simply the gift tax. Um, so an individual can generally uh, provide $15,000 maximum to another individual. Um, the good news is, is, say, if it's your parents, they both can provide $15,000 each. If you do provide any more than that, then you have to deal with what's called the gift tax. These are higher tax rates than your normal income tax or your lower capital gains tax. So something to keep in mind when you do make those kind of gift payments. And again, something you want to review with a professional. Mike, do you want to talk on that a little bit or do you think I... Um, I think you captured it pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely tax implications, but again, you always have to just realize is it if it's worth it or not. And most of the times it should end up being worth it because mm -hmm. the bigger the down payment, the lower your mortgage payments will be. And in return, the tax may not be that big of an issue for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then uh, another question we got from Andrew Jalhari. We got uh, wanted to talk over how it, whether tech companies such as Zillow and Redfin have impacted the need for a real estate agent. Um, Aaron, I figured you want yeah, to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I'm never gonna say that there will eventually not be a need for a, a real estate agent. It's possible we get there. Um, but as of right now, these tech companies still can't really compete with with real estate agents. You know, we offer a lot of value. And of course, that human to human connection is very huge, um, especially on the sales side. Yeah, you can list your home onto Zillow, onto Redfin and all these. But um, pricing your home is very critical and you can't just rely on the data that they give you. Um, it's oftentimes very inaccurate. Um, and there's a lot more that goes into it, you know, negotiating. Zillow is not going to negotiate for you. You want someone, you know, having your back. Yeah, you can have your lawyer, you know, do all that for you um, totally. But you also want someone with local knowledge who understands the real estate market. Um, and Zillow is just like not there yet. Um, maybe at some point they will be. On the buyer side, of course, you also want to have that human human representation negotiating. You know, there's a lot of legal contracts and, and paperwork to sign, like I said earlier. Um, and, and Zillow is not going to be able to help you with that. Again, yeah, you could have your lawyer, but your lawyer is probably not going to be entirely well versed <laughs> in the home buying process um, and how to negotiate specifically for homes in terms of you know price and timing. And there's a lot more that goes into it than just data that companies like Zillow can provide to you. Definitely agree. I think working with an individual still has so many benefits, especially from the negotiation and from the personal aspect that comes with it. Uh, I think you hit it on the nail, Aaron. Uh, another question I think would be directed your way also from Andrew. Uh, I was just talking over if uh, first time homeowners net the 3% commission if they purchase their own home without using an agent. No, that commission would go um, to the listing agent. So you won't get any of that. So there's literally no reason not to work with a realtor. No reason whatsoever. It's gotcha. only going to be you know, beneficial for you. Gotcha. Right. Um, and with that, that is all the questions that we have received uh, for the webinar. Uh, you, we could just give some closing comments. Mike, why don't you give some first, and then Aaron? Sure. So, yeah, I would say that buying a home is definitely exciting, but it is not something you could rush. Like Ziad said, it takes years of savings, and then it takes a few months of preparing to apply for a mortgage. And then even after that, who knows how long it'll take to find that dream home. So you don't want to rush it. You want to make sure that you have everything organized, you have everything set, and you have a very good understanding of your own financial position. And I think that's a, a good rule to have with anything in life. Just know where you're at with how much you make and how much you're spending. And just keep a track of that because you never know when something might come up. And again, I would say the most important part is growing to get that down payment. And once you are there, if you could save that much, you should have enough income to be able to cover the monthly payments. So just take your time. It's definitely difficult, especially in Los Angeles or in certain places where real estate is definitely more expensive. 
but it is doable and you will get there. Just take it one step at a time. I, I, I love that. Um, Aaron, your, your comments. Yeah, I think Mike hit the nail on the head. Uh, ditto. It's a process. It's a long process. It could take a while, but you want to be diligent. You want to take your time. You want to prepare and you want to talk to the right people who are going to guide you in the right direction. And you know, that's why we're here. I also think it's worth repeating something that Mike said, uh, or I guess reiterating something. Um, this could be different in different locations throughout the United States. Not everything we said is entirely, entirely like applicable to every state. You know, there could be minor differences, but I'd say this is a pretty good general outline that anywhere throughout the United States, someone could um, follow and get information from. But other than that, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you learned something. And of course, you know, Ziad and Mike uh, can agree. We're all here to answer all of your questions. Um, personally as well, reach out to us on all of our platforms and uh, we're here to help. Yeah, definitely. Um, we we are here to assist. Uh, just to give some closing comments of my own, you know, I think both Aaron and Mike highlighted it perfectly. Really the biggest thing is having a plan in place, is being prepared. And that's why it is so important to work with professionals like ourselves to help take care of that financial side of your life so you don't have to worry as much about it. Make that easy for you so you can focus on what's important to yourself. Um, as an advisor, you know, I'm here to make sure that you are on track for that. Um, make sure that, that you are working towards buying that home while not necessarily sacrificing from everything else that you're planning for, whether that be paying for a kid's college, whether that be retiring comfortably, anything along the lines of that. Please reach out to us um, if you do have any questions. If you're even thinking of buying a home, uh, we are happy to assist. Um, you, you have our emails here. And, um, and thank you all for joining.